opinions and views expressed in the following presentation do not necessarily reflect those of GCR Progressive Internet Radio Management, staff, or our affiliates. Toto? I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Welcome to Mobile Banshee Flair, Visionary Talk Radio on GCR Progressive Internet Radio. Fair rock in your world. Good evening, and I'm going to tell you this, whoops, has been some kind of a couple of days, um, and today we played Beat the Clock to get the um, program on so I could connect to the station, which is in Missouri, and I am not in Missouri, and I don't want to move to Missouri, so thank God we got this whole thing working together because... Um, I, I don't know all about this technical stuff. I know ghosts. That's what I know. And I know people and I know animals, but I don't know all this technical stuff. We have a really awesome show for you, and I'm so glad I could get uh, my guests on tonight, Willie Windwalker and Carla Morningstar Leg Ledger. I guess it's Ledger, L-E-G-E-R, Carla? Yes. Okay. Uh, they're going to be on in a minute. Um, I want to uh, remind everybody that animals are, um, you know, it, the weather's turning. It's getting a little rough out there now. Uh, so please, animals, I know a lot of us have been raised to think, well, it's just an animal, you know, and a dog goes outside. But, you know, even, even if you're going to put a dog outside, you have to make sure that it's got a dog house. It's got water every day. A frozen bowl of ice is not water. And, and you have to protect the animals from the elements. And because things are getting so tough right now, economically, animals are being dumped at an alarming rate. I just this week uh, got a kitten. Uh, we brought him in uh, last week. My daughter captured him in, in a trap, and I took him to the vet. And the, and the little booger was only six weeks old, and he's blind in one eye, and he's got a horrible heart murmur. And this is because somebody threw one of its ancestors out, and they've been inbreeding, and nobody's been spaying these animals. And this is what happens when you don't take care of animals and you think, well, I'll just throw it out. Please don't throw animals out. Please remember, if you take it to a shelter, hopefully it'll get a home. More likely, it'll probably be put to sleep because right now people are dumping animals like there's no tomorrow. So please, uh, you know, remember to report uh, animals you see in distress. Report animal abuse, if you see an animal you don't think is being taken care of, you know, just call the ASPCA, call somebody and try to get some attention to it. Uh, I just had another uh, horse uh, on my Facebook. Somebody said this horse is starving to death in New York, and I can't imagine how people drive past this horse every day and don't see it starving to death. I just don't understand it. But then I also understand people are afraid of getting hurt and getting involved. And animals deserve better than that. We're supposed to be better than that now. I thought the hippies were going to fix all this, but evidently they haven't. And please be mindful of animals and children. In a depression, I've never seen a, a, an empty gin mill. I always see cars and bicycles piled up by gin mills. And then animals and children are the ones that suffer. So everybody, please be mindful of that. Um, another thing is check your elderly as the weather gets uh, cold. Elderly people tend to go back and say, oh, when I was 20, I used to sit in, you know, four-degree weather, and we were in a cold water flat, and we only had the heat. Well, you're not, you're not you know, 20 anymore. You're 80 now, so you have to physically go check your elderly. Make sure their furnaces are working. Make sure they have uh, whatever they need to run the furnace. Make sure they're not walking around with candles uh, to try to heat the place up because uh, some years back, somebody by my daughter, the old lady who was walking through the house with a candle, set the whole house on fire. So families have got to really step up to the plate when it comes to their senior citizens. And I'm hoping everybody will post it on their Facebooks and Twitter. Check on your senior citizens. You know, if we all get the message out, maybe we won't have terrible, terrible accidents. Um, the the uh, government is now in its second full week of being shut down. And I've got to tell you, I don't miss it a lot. 
Uh, but then again, we um, have always worked really hard, and we're not getting assistance from, like, welfare things. So I guess that's why we don't miss it. But if anybody's been watching the news, there was a glitch with the uh, food stamps, and a dose of reality clicked in for everybody. And the dose of reality was that their food stamp vouchers, the, the cards, didn't work. And if our government crashes and we really go under, there won't be any food stamps. So everybody's going to have to start pulling their big boy and big girl pants up and start figuring out how they're going to take care of themselves. Because you can't feed half the nation for free and expect the other half to work and try to keep everything going. It doesn't work. If you think of your house, your house is just a smaller version of the United States of America. You can only spend what you're taking in. And if you start using credit cards and you have twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 debt you can't pay, you start getting sued and people don't want to lend you money anymore and tell you, gee, I lent you a lot of money, you didn't pay it back. That's what's happening to the United States now. It's in a much larger scale, but it's the same principle. And it's been building for decades. And I really hate all the finger pointing because this has been building for decade upon decade upon decade social services trying to take care of people who don't want to take care of themselves anymore i very much feel like it's like um what is it the time machine when he goes into the future and the people are just cattle and the, the people down in the, the uh, fallout shelters have reverted into these creatures. Um, it, 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 you know, that's pretty much how it's, it is right now. You have people who just give me, give me, give me, give me free food, give me this, give me that, give me free health care. And then the rest of us are saying, screw that, I work hard for my money. Why should I be giving you all this stuff? Get a job. But um, that's me, so it was nice to see a dose of reality, but now it's getting scary, and I hope that the government will pull up together and start growing up and, uh, you know, start doing what they have to do. I do have crazy but news. Um, let's see. Uh, yes, I have it, and I'm trying to find it. Oh, this young lady, um, I, I guess everybody knows what the oldest profession in the world is, and um, it's not uh, racquetball, um, but it, you know, it's prostitution. Uh, the Snuggery, it's called. The Snuggery is a new website that offers an hour of cuddling for $60. Uh, there's a young lady sitting here, sprawled out. Her name is Jackie Samuel. She's looking every ounce of uh, tramp. She's looking like, uh, you know, she's selling herself. And um, what it is, is for an hour, you can go in there and, and just cuddle. And this guy, Samuel, told the Metro that ran the story uh, that um, he just wanted to cuddle for an hour. Uh, give me a break. Uh, anybody who's saw Roger Rabbit, remember when the rabbit's under Eddie's jacket and he's bouncing all over and it's Eddie's girlfriend says, so Eddie, are you, is that a rabbit under your jacket or are you just happy to see me? This is, this is baloney. This is, this is just garbage. And anybody who pays $60 to be hugged by somebody, I don't care how good looking she is, um, uh, you know, I, I'll get one of my nieces to, to give you half price. You know, I, I'll go into the business too. It's a bunch of baloney. Um, I think it's just a way of, uh, calling a spade a, a different uh, thing. They don't, oh, what if I become sexually aroused during my s session, they were asking, and they said, don't have, worry, it happens. No shit. She's half naked. No kidding. This guy ain't going to get, you know, excited. <laughs> Give me a break here. So I, I, that, that's crazy, but it's news, and we have one in New Jersey now. That's what brought my attention to it. So that's what's going on. We have snuggeries now where you can go get felt up and pat it, and it's legal. Our guests are waiting, and I'm sure they're at this point wondering what the heck. Um, Willie Windwalker ha uh, has been on twice before. He's a good friend of ours. He is a shaman. Um, he, he has a book out called The Shaman Windwalker, Willie Gibson. 
uh, you find it on Amazon. But uh, he introduced me to uh, Carla Morningstar Le Le Ledger, and she is uh, now a uh, shaman. And it occurred to me that most people have no idea what a shaman is. How do you become one? What is the responsibility? Uh, how has it changed from the old shamans? Uh, and we decided this would be a really good show to have on. And so, Willie and Carla, welcome to the lair. Thank you. Um, Willie, I, let's just kind of do a... a you know, a uh, Reader's Digest version of what is a shaman? Um, a shaman is a very spiritual person. Um, a shaman is able to do heavy, heavy meditation work. Uh, a shaman is able to go into different dimensions. A shaman is a healer. A shaman is a counselor, uh, a spiritual counselor. A shaman is able, most shamans are gifted and able to see and hear spirits, um, energy, um, do energy work. Um, a, a lot of shamans, like I do, uh, we go out and and uh, help people that's having problems in a spiritual way, whether it be in a house or on property. Uh, if there's something going on that's negative, where we go in and we do uh, cleansings and clearings. Um, a lot of times... Uh, the negative energy is so bad that we're actually called in by other teams, um, paranormal teams, because they can't handle it. Um, a shaman is... Uh, now, for me, for me, I also uh, work with the paranormal clergy, too, so uh, shamans also assist other uh, um, people of the clergy, like um, uh, Bishop James Long has asked me to come on board with the paranormal clergy. I'm also the staff shaman for them. So I've actually gone out and assisted with uh, minor right um, exorcisms. Uh, he's called me out when Native American cases comes up, and they would rather have a shaman come in and, and talk to, to, to the shaman and see if they can... Uh, and see if I can clear out whatever is going on there. So uh, I do a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And and you did not start out because you um, it, it tell us uh, tell people who don't know about you. But you uh, your mother is Irish. Your father is an American Native Indian. But you were raised more as a, a uh, an Anglo-Saxon type child. You you weren't introduced into your uh, your ethnic uh, roots at all. And then something happened to bring you into this. Could you explain to everybody what that was? Well, um, actually, um, I was watching TV one day, and I saw um, the Cowboys kill the Indians, and I was rooting for the Cowboys, and Dad drew, you know, told me to come over to one side. He said, look, son, i got something to tell you. And he told me what, uh, what I was, and, and I asked him why didn't he tell me this to begin with. And he also he told me that uh, back then... Um, Native Americans, I mean, this was back in the 60s, Native, Native Americans were uh, still being treated kind of badly, and uh, mm -hmm. we, uh, you know, there, were, there was times that I would actually get beat up and not even know why, and Dad told me it's because of the color of my skin. Well, my color of my skin is tan, and I, I didn't think too much about it. I mean, you're a kid, you, you're, my skin is tan, the next kid's uh, skin was black, the next kid's skin was another color. You know, we were just friends. But uh, he told me about uh, racism and how that was. So, I, you know, I kind of took it to heart. It, it, this was around 10 years old, and it was about that time I started to hear uh, voices, spirits, you know, but I didn't know what it was. I... I thought it was just my imagination, but uh, after I had a, um encounter with a UFO uh, at the age of 10, I started to see and hear spirit. And um, I went and told my dad, you know, I started seeing. I didn't tell him about the UFO experience, but I did tell him that I was starting to see things, see spirits and uh, hear spirits, and he, he more or less told me to keep it to myself. Just, uh, just like he told me to keep it to myself that I was an Indian. He told me... The, that um, as far as I was concerned, just to tell everybody that, you know, I was white and, and that was it. I just I just had tan skin. So uh, he kept it, he told me to kind of keep that a secret. But uh, as I, later as I grew older, you know, I kind of said, you know what, 
I don't care. You know, I don't care if people know I'm an Indian. So, you know, I, I would tell people that. And, of course, I, you know, there was a, quite a few fights back in the 60s and the 70s over it. But, hey, that's fine. They got, they, I gave as good as I got. Right. Yeah. Um. It, they, you know, it's really hard for people now. Even people in, in their 40s, you know, my kids... My daughter is going on 42, and she's she looks back, and she knows it was rough back then in the 50s and the late 40s and all, but trying to explain how rough it was on American Indians back then, uh, it, it's, really, it's really hard to explain because people see now that this kind of behavior is not allowed, you know, even though... You can't make everybody like you. That's one thing I want to say. I think we've become people that you have to like me. You're not allowed to not like me. That's not really the way it, that's an idyllic way it should be, but that's not the way it is. But back then, you could stand there and yell out all kinds of filthy things to people, and, and that, was a, that was life. You know, um, I was a mick. You know, you dirty little Mick. Why don't you go back where you came from? You know, that kind of thing. Because we were Irish. You know, and you're taking good jobs away from, you know, us. You're, you're doing this. You're doing that. Why don't, you know, oh, don't mind her. She's just a dirty little Mick. You know, or, or a pot liquor. You know, and, and this kind of thing, it didn't go away because time's advanced. It kind of got quieter but it still was there. You saw your grandfather's spirit, didn't you? He was one of the first spirits you saw? Yeah, it, I saw my grandfather. Um, I was the only one in my family. My brothers and sisters never got to see my grandfather, but I, I actually got to see my grandfather when I was five years old, and, you know, and um, you know, I, I remember that back that far, and, of course, he died when I was five years old, so that's been over 50 years ago, but... Uh, yeah, uh, I actually saw him come back, and uh, actually, you know, one of the one of the memories I've, I've I've got of him is I was it was Christmas time, and I had snuck snuck down to kind of look at the presents and see what I got, and lo and behold, you know, I look around, there stood my grandfather, who I knew had died a year earlier, and he's standing there looking at me, smiling at me, and he kind of he kind of looked at me, I said. Papa, he, he kind of smiled, like, yeah, and I said, well, what are you doing here? I was scared. I was like seven years old, six or seven years old, and he said, you know, you know you're not supposed to be down here doing that, and, and I looked at him, he said, now you go, you go back to bed, and don't tell anybody I was here. I said, okay, Grandpa, I'd like, like it was nothing, and went back to bed and went to sleep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so it, how did you become a, sh a shaman? Uh, because uh, our guest tonight uh, is is Carla Morningstar Ledger, and now she's a um, a shaman. So take us through how how does one become? And we're going to run a little late on the commercial, but let's start talking about how does one become a shaman? Well, I, I became a shaman. I was a cop. You know, you read my book. I was a cop, mm -hmm. and. Uh, so I was brought up, you know, in a hush-hush situation about being an Indian. I was a cop, and I was assigned to a Native American burial ground. And one night about 3 o'clock in the morning, you know, I see this this Indian start walking towards the car. He just came out of nowhere, and I jumped out of the car and asked, what, are you, what, was your, what are you doing here? And he says, he smiled at me and says, I belong here. And I said, what's your name? He says, he just looked at me, and I said, what is your name? He says, my name is Singing Fox. And he looked at me, and he said, you're not. You're an Indian, are you not? I said yes. He said, "What's your Indian name?" I said, "I don't have one." He said, "From this day forward, you are Windwalker. He who walks with the spirits, and one day you will be a mighty shaman." And I looked at him and I said, "What?" And when he when he, when I when I said that, he kind of smiled and he disappeared. Well, I didn't tell anybody that the rest of the night or report it. So I got back in the car and I sat there and thought about it. And the next day, you know, I decided not to tell the commander. So that night, the next night it happened, and the next night after that it happened, he'd come back and he told me I was going to be a shaman, and he would tell me things and how to do te certain techniques and things like that. And I was kind of letting it go past me. You know, I, I, I really wanted to be a police officer. He says, and this went on for about six months, and he says, you'll be a shaman one day. 
So I was transferred out of that area after about six months, and I, I stayed in police work for another five, six years. And one day um, I decided, you know, after my father died and I saw him come back and he told, come back and he told me that I was going to be a shaman, that I, maybe I should do that. So I went on ahead, quit, the, quit my police stuff, and uh, went into training with other shamans, and uh, male and female, and... Uh, about 1988, I decided, you know, to go on and uh, go in and let everybody know I was a shaman. So I had worked with different agencies, you know, different um, uh, paranormal groups for four or five years, and uh, and you know went in and did help doing investigations that way. And it was about uh, uh, about ten years ago, I was doing the Mid South Paranormal Convention. And this lady walks in, and she was Native American, and she looked at me. She said, I would like a reading. So she sat down, and I gave her a reading, and she was stone-faced. She didn't say yay or nay or uh, that she liked a reading or not. And uh, after the reading was over, I looked her dead in the face. I said, uh, did you like your reading? And she smiled at me. She says, you know, I was sent here to test you to see if you were a real shaman by the Cherokee Nation. She said, my name is Anita Tarbell, and I'm on the council. And she says, I'm going to go back, and I'm going to tell them that you're the real thing, because if you weren't, I would have felt it. And she says, can I gift you with something? I said, what? And uh, she got up, and she went and got a bag, gave me the bag. It was sweet grass and sage, and she kind of she kind of bowed her head a little bit. She says, I'll tell everybody that you are you are a shaman. And from here on out, the Cherokee Nation will know you're a shaman. So that's that's how it happened to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to go to break because it's 9.30, and um, Caesar must be paid. Um, I, I jest, because this is actually the best station in the world. Uh, I, I am very grateful to uh, DJ Deadeye for taking me in years ago when the other station went down. And um, I, I, I owe him a lot, and I, I've been very happy here. I've got some good friends here. So uh, GCR is one of the best stations on the uh, Internet. So I'm going to be right back. We're going to go to a, a break, and let me just bring it up. I'm going to play a song, and I'm not trying to be, um, oh, God. I'm not trying to be uh, 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 sarcastic in any way, but... Um, the movie Pocahontas, the Disney movie, the song Steady as a Beating Drum. Um, I love that song. I, I think that uh, even though it's a cartoon, they did try to do the best they could uh, to bring American Native Indians into the spotlight and, and, and bring them forward. And this song, I think, is just so pretty and it always reminds me of Willie when I hear it so I decided tonight I'm going to play that I'm also going to play a, a um, Native American Indian uh, Cherokee it's called Chant of Hope it's a Cherokee uh, a song uh, piece and then uh, towards the end because uh, Willie and I both have Irish uh, roots Jethro Toll Broadsword so tonight we're going to have Native American and Irish and we're going to tip our hats to Native Americans who uh, are amazing people to to have survived all they have and, and to be going the way they are and we're going to talk to Carla as soon as we come back so we'll be right back there's no place like home there's no place like home there's no place like home there's no place like home. This is Mo inviting you to visit me at my lair. Mo Banshee's Lair Visionary Talk Radio airs every Tuesday night live on GCRInternetRadio.com. Tune in at 9 p.m. Eastern Time Zone. Topics A to Z, Mo Banshee's Lair on GCR Internet Radio. We're rocking your world. Just try to stay out of my way. Just try. I'll get you, my pretty, and your little dog, too. And welcome back. Uh, again, that was from uh, Pocahontas, and it, it's steady as the uh, 
rock. I, I like that song. Um, it, it's a beautiful uh, song. We have Carla Morningstar Ledger here. And Carla, um, tell us about yourself before you met Willie. Well, before I met Willie, um, oh, goodness, I had just um, been doing paranormal investigations here and there over the years, and I've been a tarot card reader since I was 14, and I actually joined um, a group for a short time, and in that short time, everybody says, let's go to Mid-South, so a few of us did, and there's where I met Willie. I sat down and um, had a reading, a totem reading, and I was stunned because nobody had ever been able to give me an accurate reading before, and he did, and I was really stunned by it. And I thought, okay, this is the real deal. He's the real thing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and from there on out, it just, um, you know, kind of snowballed, and... Um, you know, if, if Willie was on, you know, on Facebook, we would chat. I would tell him about a case. You know, we get, you know, he'd give me feedback or do this. You know, we would chat about things, and um, that's really how it all evolved into meeting Willie and being where I'm at today. Well, as a child, okay. you were a sensitive, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I and. Or, Go ahead. Right. I don't remember not seeing spirits. I, um, four, maybe five, I guess, is my first recollection of it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and were you afraid of these? You know, I, I always ask people this because... Um, you know, people see movies like The Sixth Sense where everybody looks like they've been in an accident and that kind of thing. I never saw those ghosts. I never saw those spirits. And it right. used to make me laugh because then, then when I got to see TV and you saw ghosts that looked like train wrecks and I was terrified I was going to meet one of these. And it took me a while to figure it out as a child that they were makey-ups, you know, and, and right. that spirits don't look like that. How was it for you? I was not scared. Um, uh, this man kept coming to my bedroom, and I would he would stand there and watch me, just watch over me as I was, you know, sleeping. And I would wake up, there he is, and, okay, I would get up and go to my parents' room. There's a man in my room. And I'm told mm -hmm. to go back to bed. You know, you're dreaming. Mm -hmm. And this went on and on and on. And the man would follow me to different places. You know, if I went to stay at an aunt's house or something, he was there. And, you know, he didn't frighten me in any way. Mm -hmm. Did so you ever figure really, out who he was? It's odd because years later in that house, they were, um, and I don't really recall what they were doing exactly, but they were, they had taken out a portion of the wall for some reason. And um, there was a picture and they picked the picture up, and I pulled it away from him, and I said, oh, that's the man that comes to my bedroom. And hmm. it was a picture of a man in a casket. Ooh. And, of course, you know, I'm told to hush, 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 you know, point it down kind of thing. And But that was the man that would come to my bedroom. Mm -hmm. And that would follow me from place to place. And you started using tarot cards, right? I started using, uh, I saw my first reading at 12. And it took me two more years to actually um, be able to get a deck. Um, down here in the deep south, you know, it was tough then to get your hands on a deck of tarot. And even when I found them, um, they would not sell them to me. I had to get somebody else to go in and buy them for me. Mm -hmm. And um, but I started reading at fourteen. Mm -hmm. And because my first when when I saw the first the guy done the reading for me, I knew everything he had just told me was wrong. And mm -hmm. because the cards were almost it was it was telling a story. 
for lack of yeah. a better term, it was telling a story. And that's not what he told me. So, you know, I knew, I thought, oh, he's wrong. And uh, so I was 14, I finally got some and started reading. And and how did you start reading? I mean, do they come with a, a guidebook or something that says what everything means? Yeah, they do, but eh, I, that's the first thing. Anytime I'm trying to teach somebody how to read Tara, the first thing I do is toss that book. Right. Because I do that with driving, too. <laughs> yeah. Um, toss the book. Learn to rely on your gut and what you're hearing mm -hmm. and what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And not what is printed on that page because that is so just generic. Right. Yeah, you know, um, my daughter was learning to drive, and we did we did the go to the the uh, driving school so that you know the insurance is a little bit less and blah 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 blah. And I got in the car with her, and we were you know approaching a car that was stopped in front of us, and I kept saying, you know, the car stopped, that car is stopped, and she says, oh, my driving instructor told me I don't have to stop until um, I can't see the top of their back tires. And uh, I had her pull over because we did survive. I said, stop the car! And I says, okay, everything they taught you, you've got your, uh, what do you call it? You've got your uh, permit. I want you to forget everything they taught you now because, uh, you know, it's you're right. It's a very generic, and they forget to teach you to use common sense. Right. And you need and, that, right, to read them? Well, you know, I, I guess you do. You need common sense. You need, you know, to be able to listen. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to be able to look almost through the cards and see the story that the cards are showing you. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, the book is just, you know, that little pamphlet. It's that a guide. Like that. It's a little guide. Yeah, a, a starter guide. thing. It, it just needs to be tossed out uh -huh. and learn. You need people need to learn to listen to their own inner self because I think everybody has that um, somewhat of an instinctual ability to, um, you know, feel and see things. Some have it greater, some have a little bit, but I, I think we all have uh -huh. it to a degree. When did you start investigating and helping people with hauntings? Oh, my first actual investigation was probably in my early 20s. Mm -hmm. And it was just a local thing where I, I lived in a different county. Um, and at that time, you know, down here in the Deep South, you couldn't get a you know stick of sage. You couldn't get sweet grass. You couldn't get any of that. Um, and I literally went, and I don't know how I need to do it, but I went and got an old corn broom and basically swept the negativity out of the house, mm -hmm. and then tossed the broom. And that was my first one. And I was in my early twenties, probably twenty one, twenty two, maybe. Mm hmm. Um, I, I hate so how out. many years has it been that you've been helping people now um if you want to count the tarot readings um uh, gosh I'm 42 now so um long time about 30 mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. um and, and we were talking uh, on the uh, you know in the chat uh, the other day and we both agreed that Ghosts don't scare us. People do, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You never know what you're really going to walk into on a case. What's some of the worst things you've walked into? Oh, gosh. Um, no names, just generalization, you know. I think one of the worst, and it wasn't a case, um, it was actually a reading I was doing, and um, I uncovered a lot of molestation. Mm -hmm. And um, 
It, it was horrific. And the mother was aware. Um, it, and it, it was just, um, you know, a father molesting his sons. And, mm-hmm. you know, I had to just back out. I actually got sick. I, I mm-hmm. got sick. And I had to back out and just, you know, calling the authorities. And right. that really bothered me and stuck with me for a long, long time. Um, yeah, it, a real case, when you walk into something like that, that means you're obligated by law to call the police and report it. Absolutely. And I, I think that's one of the ones that stuck with me. Um, even though it wasn't, it, you know, a, a paranormal case, um, it involved such injury and horrific things done to children. Uh, you know, it just, it, that one stuck with me. Mm-hmm. Do you find yourself sensitive with animals? Oh, yeah. Yes, very. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's with my house full of cats and my bulldog, of course, and I have chickens and um, the squirrels come. And you have a dog that steals oh, chicken dog. eggs? Yes, he ate his chicken egg today. Um, mm-hmm. And ravens or crows are, um, for some reason, really always close by. And mm-hmm. I actually were feeding ravens straight out of my hand at one point where I used to work. And um, it was it was quite amazing. I, I really liked that. Mm-hmm. So you met you met Willie at a reading. How long ago? Gosh, Willie, when was that? Six months uh, ago? Three months, four months ago. Three, four okay. Months ago? And ha- when you met her, Willie, what did what was your impression? Well, you know, being being a shaman master, and I've actually entitled many shamans before. Uh, I've actually trained many shamans, but I've actually had a lot of people come to me that was actually uh, performing shaman uh, uh, techniques years and years before they even met me, and they actually sat down and I talked to them, and I gave them, you know, after talking to them, I can look around their aura and to see what kind of energy they have. Well, when Carla sat down, she had that that glow, that energy about her that told me that um, she is she was shaman because it, it, a lot of shamans bring that energy back through time with them, through other through other uh, lifetimes, and this energy was there. And uh, I got to talking to her a little bit and found out that she had been doing a lot of uh, investigation work, a lot of counseling work. Uh, Carla is a very good, very good with herbs. Um, she's very good with healing. Um, and uh, after after talking to her for several months, and and she Carla is, is kind of a person that don't really. Um, to her own horn a lot, but she she actually goes out and does things by herself that's really, really dangerous, but she has no choice because she's the only one that could do that certain thing. I mean, Carla goes out and, and uh, she's had a lot of negative cases, a lot of demonic energy type of situations where she's actually had to go out by herself and do these things and clear things out. Uh, she had no... Uh, kind of back up at all from any kind of clergy. Uh, no kind of priest will, will work, would work with her because they, they didn't want to take on the case. Ministers, same way. So um, I knew she was shaman from a past life, and she brought that energy back in this past lifetime, this, this lifetime, and she'd actually been doing the work but not being gave the title. So um, I told her a few days ago that she needed the title of shaman. She needed to come out and show shaman that she was shaman and she needed to have an Indian name. So as, as of that day, uh, I, I entitled her as shaman and gave her the, uh, the t- her, her Indian name as Morning Star. So now she's known as Carla Morning Star Ledger, and now she can go out and having the, having the brought out the, the shaman uh, entitlement gives her that, that power to go out and do uh, the spiritual entitlements. If she's got to do a clearing, she she does it as a shaman, like like uh, she's supposed to do. So she was always a shaman. She just needed a master shaman to entitle her to go do 
so, and that's what I did. Um, let me ask a question, and and it's very naive because you know I'm Irish Catholic, so I wouldn't know. Uh, wouldn't don't you have to be a Native American to be a shaman, or or that's just a, you know a mistake on my part? The, there are shamans all over the world. There are Russian shamans, you know, all types of shamans. But uh, Carla does have Native American blood. Um, okay. Her, 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 you know, her um, grand grandparents were Native American, so she has Native American blood. She also has, I think, she told me she has some German blood too. So she she has the Native American blood go, flowing through her veins. Uh, as far as you have to be a shaman, uh, a Native American to be a shaman. No, there are shamans. All over in every culture. Well, yeah, you know they're they're called different things in different uh, you know cultures and stuff. Wise men, uh, you know that kind of thing. Uh, lions uh, are called yeah. kahunas, you know that that type. But yeah. they're still they're they're still shaman. Yeah. Okay, so a shaman is, is a healer in, in any any. Uh, 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 ethnic uh, background. Let me ask you, uh, Carla, what religion were you raised in? I was raised absolute Southern Baptist. I was going to say Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. I was raised absolute Southern Baptist. Yes. And how, how do they, you know, how does the family uh, reconcile that you're going out and um, helping people with hauntings and doing this work. Uh, for lack of a better thing, I always call myself a um, a social worker for the dead. Uh, but pretty basically, right? You know. So, how does your family uh, reconcile this? Well, well, that's funny because honestly, I hid it very well for many years. Um. And they pretty well had no clue until here recently. Yeah. And I really don't care, honestly, um, because it's their opinion. Um, and don't get me wrong, I love them, but their uh -huh. opinion of what I do does not, cannot even compare to what I do. Mm. You know, their opinion of me, that's small compared to what I do when I go out and I help a family. Right. So, I, I would hope that they would embrace me, but if they don't, that's their choice, because I'm the same person I was 10 years ago, doing the same thing. It's just now I'm really out and open with it. Right. It's kind of like See, my coming out of the closet paranormal. Yeah. A little bit. Uh, my niece, my oldest niece, one time, uh, I don't know, a couple of years ago, we were talking and I was talking about a case that was going on and she finally said, is that what you do? And I says, yeah. <laughs> and and I says, what did you think was going on when we dropped the kids off at Graham's at, you know, two in the morning running out, you know? I says, what did you think? We didn't love them or something, you know? <laughs> and, and it, it kind of never even um, crossed my mind that they didn't understand what I was doing. I mean, my father, my mother did, you know, my sister, you know, everybody. Uh, but the, some of the kiddies didn't quite grasp it, I guess. And it kind of shocked me that, how did you not know, you know? Uh, even my sister says, what are you kidding? How did you not know? She was taught by Hans Holzer. How did you not know what was going on, you know? Um, how, what? How did you learn? What did you do for resources when you were young? You know, I like I said, we you know then you can't get a stick of sage, um, and I remember as a child watching my grandmother make um, corn brooms, uh -huh. and, and that was one thing that I that slipped back in my memory. I thought, gosh, you know, she made such great corn brooms, and and that's where I got the idea to oh, okay, energy is energy, and it can be moved with something, you know, positive, and I took, you know, a corn broom and swept, you know, the negativity out, which was my first, very first um, case, and um, after that, you know, that's pretty well what I did until I could, 
you know, until Sage became pretty available. And, um, mm-hmm. But did you go to, like, I know when I was a kitty, um, and, and I don't want to say I was Abe Lincoln, I, you know, didn't walk five miles, but I definitely walked at least four to the local library, and, you know, I was scouring the shelves for anything that would help me, you know. It wasn't until my mother walked in with a Hans Holzer book and said, I think this guy is going to be able to help you out a lot, you know, and then I got to meet him and, and, and all. Uh, did you go to libraries looking for answers? No, I really didn't. Um, it just all seemed to come naturally. Yeah. Um I just would know what to do with this step and this step, you know, and, and it was really a natural process. And I know that sounds mm-hmm. odd. Um, and the only book I actually recall was my mother had gotten a book from the library about Ed Lorraine Warren. And But I was only 10 or 12. And I remember trying to read it, but I didn't understand it. Yeah, I have the um, same problem with them. <laughs> I didn't understand it. So, you know, everything that I that I do is, is pretty well, you know, I'm told what to do, mm-hmm. you know, by my guides, or it's just the feeling, okay, this is the right thing, I need to burn this sweet grass here <laughs> after I, you know, cleanse this house, yada, yada. You know, it's it's come really naturally. Is is that is that what drew you to her, uh, Willie? That she has that natural ability. Well, like I said, when I when I first saw her energy, I knew that she had the the shaman uh, background from previous lifetimes. Oh, she that's what she's doing. She's starting to access that a lot of that now, and it's coming natural to her. I just brought out a few of the things that that that. Um, she caught on to the, where she understands what's going on now, and now she's, you know, like I said, she's good at, you know, at her herbal uh, treatments. She's good at her energy uh, healings. Um, she, you know, she she does all of her uh, investigation work alone because, you know, she there's nobody around there to actually help her. She is it. That's why she needs to to come out and say, yes, I am a shaman. I've always been a shaman through all my lifetimes. Mm-hmm. Um, Carla, uh, we, we've talked quite a bit. Uh, when you're on a case, I, for me, speaking for myself, I'll use anything that will make my clients stand up and, and stand up for themselves because that's usually what you really need. You're going to leave. They're going to be there. Um, do you find that to be true? You know, find find what they get inner strength from. Do you uh, do that too? Um, usually by the time it gets around to me, they're pretty whipped. Um, mm-hmm. And generally when I go in, I will cleanse the house, you know, figure out, of course, what's going on first. And then um, do a cleansing. Then I usually go back and sit down and tell them, you know, this is what you need to do to empower yourself, you know, to keep this from happening again. You need to let go of the past. You need to, you know. I, I never encourage people to uh, yell or scream at any, right. you know, any spirit or entity. Um, right. I don't, I think it kind of has the opposite effect. Um, yeah, to piss them off. Right. And, um... But yes, I, I do go back once the you know I do the cleansing because usually I'm pretty darn tired after that. Right. But I always go back the next day or a day after, and you know teach them some things they can use in their own home. And I always encourage them to find you know some sort of religious um, you know following church anything you know to help them through and. Most people, some people take the advice. I found, you know, it's about half and half. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. It, it, one thing that I try to explain to them is, I I have to leave. You're going to be here, and this is what happened. And now you have to stand up against it. And and the reason I do that is because when I first had my first demonic. 
my father said to me, you got to go back. This is your test. You're the one that's got to stand up against it. And that's when it clicked and I went, oh, my God, you know, you always knew about this. Why didn't you say anything? And he just said, you know, this is your problem. you got to go back and hand it because I wanted him to come back with me. And he said, no, 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 no. You, you're the one that's going to have to stand it down now. You're the one it's attacking. And when you have a client, you kind of have to do the same thing. Um, scariest, uh, scariest scenario you've come up against. Did you come up? Have you come up against anything that you thought might be in over your head? Oh yes, <laughs> I um, was working a case one night, and it was actually. I could feel there was something there, and I kept thinking, saying it was under the bed, it was under the bed, but there was nothing under the bed, but there was, and I knew there was, and the owner said, well, maybe could it be under the house, under the bed, because the access door to under the house is right there, so I take off outside, and it's 9, 10 o'clock at night, I crawl under the house, with a flashlight and I'm crawling and I get to this site and I thought oh this is not good and you know I'm just sweating bullets and and you know I'm getting the nauseous sensation and, and I thought this is not good and I, all I had with me was a seat was a container of sea salt and a bit of holy water and a flashlight and as I started um, sealing the site, the flashlight went out. And I could hear some sort of animal or uh, mm -hmm. something scurrying around under there with me. But I, I couldn't see it. It was pitch black. Um, but once, I, and I just kept going with my sea salt, and once I had finished... The flashlight popped back on. Mm -hmm. And I had sealed the site. And I came out and promptly threw up and had to go back in again and, and seal it with some holy water. And that I think that was one of my most frightening um, because I could not... You know, visually, with my eyes, I could not see what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And in that, I actually um, ended up with three burns mm. because I could not see where the ritual site was, you know, in the dark. I en ended up with three burns. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question. Um, where do you get your uh, holy water from? Um, I sneak in at the local Catholic church and get it. You sneak and in? And I always leave, <laughs> I always, I always leave them a, a nice little donation for that, um, because it's not, um, it's kind of a little bit frowned upon. Yeah. Um, especially me, a woman, going in, you know, grabbing holy water, um, so I just leave them a donation and and hope for okay. the best. <laughs> right. We have to go to break um, because the show is flying, actually. And uh, the the song that we're going to play a, a, after uh, the commercial is Chant of Hope. It's from the Cherokee Nation, Native American Indians. Uh, and uh, it's very pretty, and I hope you guys will like it. And, and we'll be right back with... Uh, Willie Wynn Walker and, and Carla Morningstar Ledger. And we'll be right back. Hey, I'm Bill Staten, your resident Beatles expert. I listen to Game Con Radio. Why? Because it's cool. I listen to it 
you should too. That's GameCon Radio. I'll see you there. To uh, Mo Batchy's Lair. Uh, and our guest tonight, uh, we have two shamans on Willie Wynn Walker Gibson and, and Carla Morningstar Ledger. And Carla is a new shaman. Um, evidently, she's been a shaman most of her life, but now she has the title to go with it. So I'm going to start asking um, some uh, questions to you guys. Um, what, what kind of equipment do you use uh, when you go out? You get a you get a, a case, and and you and I both agree when a child is involved, that gets first attention. That is very important, right. and and so what what do you do? What's your first thing you do when you get the call? I absolutely get every bit of information I can. Mm-hmm. Um. And. I'll get a little feeling that usually they're not telling me everything, and if I keep pushing, generally there'll be you know a Ouija board come up or this or that. Uh, so I try to get as much information as I can 
Um, but my what I carry with me on an investigation is a actually an old um, hard sided suitcase or train case, and it yeah. has everything I could ever need in any situation that could come up. Because I do go out by myself, so I can't really leave anything to chance. And it's got everything from sweetgrass to um, sage cedar bundles to um, holy water, you know, er everything I could need. Yeah. Uh, what, you know, what, what is the purpose of the sweet grass? A uh, sage, I know, is, is uh, you know, I know it's long been a disinfectant. It's cleaned the air from uh, pretty much it's what our, our Lysol, our spray Lysol is, is what sage was. It's the, the grandfather of spray disinfectant and stuff. What does the sweet grass do? Well, personally, what I use the uh, sweetgrass for is, um, and, and I, there's people that use it in different ways, but for me, I use it once I've cleansed the house to bring positive energy back in the house, to pull it back in, positive. Okay. Uh -huh. And um, that's how I use it. Um, I don't know how, if that's the same way Willie uses it. Um, Willie, jump in there. Did we lose him? Uh oh. Did we lose him? Uh uh. Did we lose him? Let me find Willie, you there? I don't know where he is. Okay, uh because he's still on oh wait. Nope, I did lose him, evidently. So let me see if I can uh add people to this call. Let me try Da, 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 da. Hello? Did we lose you? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I didn't realize that. We were talking about sweet grass and sage, and I was asking Carla what she, her thoughts on sage are and sweet grass. What are your thoughts on sweet grass? Um, it's like any other tool that you use, you've got to be very, very careful with sage or sweet grass. Uh, when I go in and I do a walk through a house, um, I got to know what I'm doing before I before I start pulling out, you know, sage and sweet grass. But they are very effective. Um, you know, I have used both of them. Um, a lot of people don't realize if you do not sage a proper way or use the sweet grass a, pro a proper way, it's not going to work. Uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, I said, you know, uh, I said if you're going to use sage, let me sh show me how you use it. And they'll, they'll pull out a little spray and they'll light it up and there'll be a little bit of smoke going around. I said, no, 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 no. That, that's, you're not sage and you're just, you're just, you're just uh, spinning your wheels there. Let me show you how to sage it. And I'll fire up the sage or, or the sweet grass, and I'll, I'll make it look like a London fog in there. I said, now that's how you sage. Mm -hmm. um, and, and of course, it, it's like anything else. You, you start at the innermost, and you, you force it out, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I was asking uh, equipment. Do you use uh, cameras and an EVP, ca uh, Carla? Do you record voices, you know, uh, all that jazz? No, I don't do that. Um, very rarely, um, you know, sometimes I'll have somebody, you know, that's in the house snap a couple pictures if I feel that something's close. Um, but usually, no. Um, mm -hmm. I don't use any of that for the most part. Mm -hmm. Well, you're usually by yourself, so if something goes missing in right. the house, I mean, um, you know, <laughs> when you know, most teams, uh, especially now with all the people getting involved in this, you hear so much about theft now. And, and, you know, how the homeowners are finding things missing and stuff. So I like to have our cams. So I know where everybody is. So, you know, if something goes missing, I know pretty much who did it. And it's not our team, you know. Um, 
let me ask, uh, what do you think uh, about, what do you do when you prepare to go out on a case? Well, it, it depends on, on what I've already found out. Um, you know, if it's just an evil entity, um, generally I just pick up my case. I, I actually pray and do a lot of meditation before I go. Um, but once I start, you know, I just pick up my case with everything in it and um, go and do, do a walkthrough and... That's really my preparation is prayer and meditation beforehand. Mm -hmm. And without that, you know, that's you're kind of walking into, or, you know, or, or I think a hornet's nest otherwise. Mm -hmm. I always ask for discernment, you know, give me wisdom and, and use me that I might glorify you. That's, I, I'm not in this to, to, to make myself this big, I don't know, celebrity or whatever. When I when I have a case, I, I tell God, you know, use me that you get the glory. You know, use me to help these people. You know, it's not about me. It's about them and, and right. getting some kind of comfort into this uh, house. What do you think about all this stuff on TV the last 10 years? I think, just my opinion... I think it is a great learning tool of how not to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I, it's a great way to show everybody how not to go out and do an investigation. Yeah. Um, I. Do you post pictures? Uh, do you have a website? I do not post pictures, no. No. Uh, and and um, how do people learn about you? Well, actually, just over the years, it's been word of mouth. Right. Literally. I've never advertised. I've never, uh, you know, it was just word of mouth. Mm -hmm. Oh, here, you know, I know this weird girl over here that, that you know, she's kind of into stuff like this. Maybe well, we were weird her. people. I, we know these people. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it was just really a word of mouth thing over the years. Um, i never done any type of advertising. Um, they just always found me. And yeah. it was it was word of mouth, and um, you know, like I said, somebody might say, "Hey, I know this weird chick over here that's you know into this," and they would send somebody my way. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, how weird? Um, you know, I'm I'm a Christian, and um, I'm a uh, very yeah. um, I'm a very uh, uh, strong Christian. Uh, I used to pinch his as a, uh, a minister, in fact. Uh, so I I do love the Lord, and he is my shield. I don't need right. to go out and beat up people because he's my protection, you know. He's my shield. Right. I can't do this because I don't think it would make... I don't have to sit there and say, God wants you to do this, or God wants you to do that. All I say is right. I can't do that because I don't think he would want me to do that, you know. So he's my shield. That's how I use him as a shield. Um, are you married? Oh, Lord, have mercy, no. No? <laughs> That's a bad word. No. <laughs> oh, the M word. Well, we. I have a bad word. M it's word called is bad. Yeah, the D word, demon. In my team, um, they'll go, don't say the D word to her, you know, because everything now with TV is a, a demon, yeah. I, I Because... Um, oh, it's, yes, if they it's, ever... It's a struggle. It's, it's a struggle on a relationship unless you're lucky and you're like me. I married somebody just as weird as me. Uh, are you into, like, goth? I mean, do you like horror movies, you know, uh... What when you're downtime? What's your downtime like? When I'm in, when I'm down, I'm trying to repair chewed up furniture from my bulldog. Uh -huh. Um, trying to clean up the mess after that dog. Um, a huge amount of time is spent on that dog. Mm -hmm. Um, and other times, downtime. Um, me and some friends will a lot of times go to uh, a local club on Fridays or Saturday and, mm -hmm. you know, <clears throat> have a drink or two and 
And that's pretty well it, really. Mm -hmm. Um, My bulldog keeps me... uh, My daughter was not this bad at two. My my daughter was a saint compared to this bulldog. (laughs) Yeah. um, We have five cats here, and they all are very, very different. Uh, Trouble is whatever, and Zach is kind of, what? What was that? What was that? And um, Storm is, but I'm the baby. I He's the prima donna. I'm the baby. Wait a minute, you know. And then we have Merlin, who's kind of like, oh, you ain't got no idea. Um, and then now we have this little kitten, and he's just kind of coming into his own. And he's still kind of like, wow, what is this and what is that? Because he's been feral. He's, you know, he's never been in a house. So, you know, they're all very different. But one thing they all know how to do is get into trouble. They, they just excel at it, you know. It's it, it's and, great. Yeah, and having the bulldog and also having cats, it's a constant. Um, well, Ralphie, my old orange tabby, bless his heart, the bulldog runs up to him and Ralph has to, you know, slap him around a few times and then, you know, and then mm-hmm. it's a run, just a, just a marathon through the house. So whatever's in the way gets knocked over. Uh, I've, I mean, you know, if somebody walked in my house, they would, you know, absolutely just say this is poltergeist activity because I've came in and, and there, you know, I've had tables, my, you know, turned upside down. Yeah. And mm-hmm. it was from the bulldog, you know, right. chasing a cat. And uh, so the bulldog keeps me really busy. Yeah. Um, it, have you worked with Willie on cases? No, I have not, but one day I hope to. That'd be great. Mm-hmm. I mean, are you near each other or are you away from each other? How does this, you know? I'm in North Carolina. And, and, in and he's in Tennessee, right? Uh, no, Kentucky. Kentucky? Willie? Did I lose you again, Willie? I'm here. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, we were just talking about the possibility of you guys working together. Um, so... Where do you see yourself going with this? Uh, because now you're you're on the radio and you're getting your feet wet. Um, what what is it you want people to know about your mission with this, Carla? My mission is honestly to actually just just help people that honestly need the help that are not there to go. Are you going to record this? Will this be on TV? Are you yeah. going to tell people this? Would would you? Do you have a Facebook page to put this on? That's not what I'm there for, and that's not what right. I do. I don't want that. It's solely 100 percent help. Mm-hmm. Yeah, giving them back their lives, pretty basically, and sometimes Absolutely. that means making them face stuff they don't want to face. Um, right. it's sometimes it's, you know, hey, you got a drinking problem. Hey, you got a drug problem. Hey, uh, you know, this, this isn't poltergeist at night. This is your kids running around like animals, you know, or whatever is going on, you know? Um, right. and, and, or, you know, hey, your old man's beating the crap out of you or your old lady's beating the crap out of you, you know? It's, it's mm-hmm. kind of, uh, it, it is, it's very hard. And when you get these kind of cases, the last thing a lot of these people need is to be exploited and put on uh, TV uh, with these shows. Um, what do you think about all the, um, the the technology they use on, on these shows? Uh, I think the technology is good in some sense that, in, you know, in a few instances it does... Um, you know, give credit, you know, as far as EVPs, uh, you know, that there are disembodied voices, um, you know, and that there's almost too much technology. Um, I think so much of it can be faked. Mm-hmm. Um, Wishful thinking. You know, especially 
with, um, you know, with pictures, those can be faked really quickly. Um, you know, I, th I think there's a good side to it and a bad side. Yeah. Willie, what and, do you think? Well, when I first went out and started going out with teens, I didn't know what the heck they were doing. I didn't know what an EVP was. I didn't know what a laser grid was. So I actually had to go to school, you know, and learn how to, what, what they were doing. And they had to kind of stand back and see what I was doing. So it was kind of the best of both worlds. But I usually tell them when I, if I do go out and assist a team, just let me do a walkthrough and I'll walk back out and I'll tell you my opinion of it then you go in and set your equipment up and see if you can get anything on your equipment. But, uh, you know, as far as me using anything, uh, I do, you know, I, I, I use myself and I don't have a lot of equipment. I, I mean, I have, I have, uh, film equipment, but I, I don't usually take it out with me. Now, uh, we did go out a couple months ago and, uh, we did visit, uh, one of the oldest cemeteries in Louisville and, uh, we did do a DVD. Bishop, Bishop Long did a DVD just to show what my Soul Warriors does. Now, Soul Warriors, we got, you know, I put a team together called Soul Warriors, and we are sensitive, and Bishop Long is on my team, uh, Kat Lane is on my team, my, my wife Shimon, myself, and uh, Brian McAuliffe. Now, Brian usually he'll stand back, and he might have a camera. He's also sensitive, too, so he might have a camera and, and take a few pictures, but we did the DVD just, just to show exactly what we do when we do go on a case. And uh, I just we just put the, the, the equipment down and let it roll and let people see exactly what a sensitive does when they do go out and work on a case from start to finish. And uh, actually, uh, you know, the cemetery was uh, was really uh, really messed with. I mean, people were buried on top of each other, uh, six six deep. Uh, uh, mausoleums were broken into, vaults were broken into, ashes were scattered. I mean, there was a lot, there was a lot of unrest there, and there still is, but I, I did the best I could to, uh, you know, kind of relieve the tension. Uh, uh, we did some ceremonial stuff there, Native American ceremony, and uh, did releasing. So we kind of calmed it down a little bit there, but uh, we, I, 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 too, don't, don't take a lot of equipment with us. Uh, Usually we're called out after a fact, after an investigation's done by a team that says, hey, we found something here. We can't handle it. You guys go in and see what, what, if you can help. So we do that, and uh, as of about five years ago, I just decided uh, just to go out and do the case from start to finish myself. And uh, uh, if, the, if the client wanted some kind of proof, I mean, we could give them EPPs. We can show them stuff on camera, but... Usually we don't use a we don't use a whole lot of stuff. We just go out and um, take care of whatever's going on in there. I mean, if we run into a demonic, I mean, we've got Bishop Long there. Um, I have assisted with exorcisms um, and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, a lot of this equipment was never designed for what they're using for. It's very interesting, but at the end of the day, for one of our cases, it, it really doesn't mean much because I'm not there to collect evidence. I think too many too many teams now that are they're all about collecting evidence so they can prove there's some kind of activity and we all know there's activity, you know, we all know there's spirits. We can't explain it. Um, and don't ask me why God doesn't make everybody go to heaven. I don't know why. Uh, but that's his job and that's cool. Um, I'm not going to ask for that job because uh, I know I would suck at it. Um, you know, I mean, I probably would be, you go to hell, you go to hell, you go to hell. You know, so that's why I don't have that job. But a lot of this equipment they use is just um, smoke and mirrors, in, in my opinion. And it just makes the field even more muddy and cloudy and, and stuff like that. When we come back, I'm going to ask you... Uh, both what you think the most important things uh, in a team is, uh, the most important um, characteristic of, of a team. Um, I'll have to ask you what you think the most important thing is that you do uh, because you don't have a team, but Willie will have to tell me. And Willie, you're, we're going to talk about you have a convention coming on, a Paracon in St. Louis next year, right? And, and Louisville. 
in Louisville. Okay, and uh, also uh, I want to remind everybody that Rose Hill Cemetery in New Jersey is going to be having Halloween tours of uh, the Rose Hill Cemetery. It is the most haunted cemetery in New Jersey. It dates back to uh, the 1800s. It is the perfect example of a garden uh, walk cemetery the, back when uh, horses were messing on the roads and all that stuff and there were flies. People were looking for places to walk and they decided to make cemeteries these beautiful art places where you could see beautiful uh, art and, and monuments and there would be fountains and there would be ponds and the kids could play uh, with their balls and things and you could lay out a picnic thing and you could walk up and down and that's why all the uh, monuments started becoming so huge and better than this one and better than that one. Um, it is also the resting place of the uh, victims from the 1906 uh, shark attacks that the book uh, Jaws is based on. That's a real story uh, that pretty basically is exactly like the movie, only in 1906 uh, kids were swimming and a shark came up Matawan Creek uh, and uh, nailed one of them. One of the boys ran back and got Stanley Fisher, who was working in a store. He ran back, got a boat, and tried to get the boy's body and the shark, shark nailed him. They're all buried up there at Rose Hill. So Saturday, October 19th at 10 a.m., then that's this coming Saturday. Then Sunday, October 20th at 2 p.m., that's this coming Sunday. And then the following Sunday, October 27th at 2 o'clock, uh, there's going to be tours. It's $10 for an adult. Uh, the tickets uh, are available at the Cemetery of the Day, or you can go to the Burroughs Mansion in Matawan. Uh, local historian Al Savalane, our favorite historian, uh, the cemetery man, will be giving the tours. There are fascinating stories. The Great Matawan Fire of 1901, 19, the 1896 murders, uh, I'm sorry, it was the 1916 shark attacks, uh, there's lawmen of uh, Matawan, the uh, mausoleums, there's uh, the strange death in the Ma uh, Matawan Hotel House, uh, unusual ghost stories, uh, stones just falling out of the air and, and falling on people that walk through the cemeteries. Uh, there's so many great stories, uh, so I hope people will go to Matawan, New Jersey this weekend and go on a ghost tour. All the proceeds are going to um, help the uh, Matawan Historical Society maintain the uh, Burroughs Mansion and the uh, cemetery. So when we come back, we will uh, talk about, uh, you know, the characteristics that Willie looks for in a team and, and what uh, Carla thinks is the, the best characteristic she has and uh, we'll be right back. Whoever said size does not matter never heard of us. <laughs> we give it to you long... <clears throat> Sorry. Hard and fast. Game Con Radio. We rock your game. And welcome back to Mo Banshee's Lair on GCR Internet Radio. And uh, our guests, uh, I hope you guys have liked the music selections tonight. Uh, our guests are uh, Willie Windwalker Gibson, who is a shaman, and now Carla Morningstar Ledger. She is a shaman. Uh, Willie, it, it, um, tell them where they can get a hold of you. Uh, they can get a hold of me, Willie Gibson, on Facebook. Uh, they can get a hold of me on Soul Warriors on Facebook. They can get a hold of me on um, the Paranormal Clergy website, also the Inspire Radio Network uh, website. Uh huh. And Carla, give them your Facebook uh, information. It's Carla AJ at Facebook. Uh, my email address is Tyson T Y F F I N. Seven at yahoo.com. Mm -hmm. Carla, what is the characteristic that you think 
makes you successful at helping people? I don't candy coat it. Mm -hmm. I don't go in and I tell them what they need to do and there's no variation and I give them their, you know, what could happen if they don't. I lay out everything for them mm -hmm. and I don't candy coat anything for anybody and I think that upfront honesty is, is, you know, is what gets me through it and, and helps them. Mm -hmm. It, it isn't always appreciated either with a client. No, it's not, but I'm not going to be second-guessing myself in any way. Um, mm -hmm. And if I tell them straight up to begin with, then I don't have to go back and repeat myself so many times. And, you know, if they call, I say, well, you know, I told you to do this, and have you? No, you didn't. Well, you need to. Mm -hmm. You know, it's almost, you almost have to, or I do, I take the mother role almost and say, you know, do this, do this, do this. Mm -hmm. And I guess in a way I'm a little bit forceful, but being that I do this alone, I have to be and to get my point across and to make them understand this is what you've got to do in order to have your life back and have it, you know, in a, in a normal state. Mm-hmm. So I think me being pretty upfront it is what is a good thing for me, mm -hmm. as far as what I bring to people. Yeah, keeping it real and, and um, not not telling them what they want to hear, especially exactly. when ninety nine percent of the time has nothing to do with the ghost. There may be an army of ghosts there, but that's not the real problem. You know, right. and now you've got to deal with these people with abuse or some kind of issues, mental illness. I mean, I had a case I was brought in on, um, and uh, this this very famous demonologist told this girl she had four demons on her, and then he walked out. And as it turns out, she had a chemical uh, problem, uh, depression, and... Uh, she ended up almost killing herself, and I had to intervene and get a hold of the police and everybody else, and then she ended up in jail, and at first she hated me for it, but then she realized, oh my God, you know, you saved my life, you know, uh, and people don't want to hear that all the time. It's dangerous. Willie, what do you think is the most, what characteristic do you look like for, for your team? What do you think is the most important thing? Um, when I chose my team members, I, 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 it took me a while. Um, of course, I've got Bishop James Long uh, on my team now. He actually came to me, wanted to be a Soul Warriors. He said, I'm, I'm Native American. I, not a lot of people know this, but I'm Native American, and I'm also a bishop of the old Catholic Church, and I'm, a, you know, I'm an exorcist, but I also have my Native roots. And he says, I want to be with you, and I want you to you know, uh, teach me um, the shaman and the shaman's way. So um, I was really honored for that, and he also made me a member of the paranormal clergy. Um, I The people on my team are very spiritual. Uh, they are very courageous. Uh, I know when we go out and tackle a case that I'm not going to be standing there alone. Uh, they are with me from start to finish. Uh, the reason I... Uh, that I put the Soul Warriors together was because I would get called out, called out all the time on cases that that were unsolved. Uh, a team would go out and do a case. Says, well, okay, they got a they got a haunting. Uh, okay, they got, I have a demon. We want to take care of it, Willie. You know, and I just got tired of it. I said, well, if I got to do this. I'm just going to start it from start to finish and bring my team in so the people that we're helping can see, hey, there's a priest there. Hey, there's a shaman there who is also a Pentecostal minister. Um, there's, a, you know, I've got another shaman. I've got my wife who is a sensitive and talking tongues, and she drums. And, about, you know, all everybody that I've got with me is very, very religious and very, very courageous in what to do. Uh, I, I know they, we've got each other's back. If one of us goes down, the other would, would pick it up and to take it on. So uh, that's what I look for in my team. Um, that way, when I go in, when we bring in soul warriors, when soul warriors are calling to a, a, we don't go out looking for trouble. I mean, we just don't go out and say, oh, there's a 
there is a uh, hospital we want to go and, and check out and see what the Soul Warriors can do in there. Or there's a penitentiary. Let's go in and see what's going on. So Soul Warriors are only called out when they're needed. And um, mm-hmm. people say, well, you know, uh, why don't you go investigate this place and tell us what you think of it? Why? It's already been investigated. I mean, Ghost Adventures have been there 20 times. But, we, you know, what do we need to go and do that for? I said, we only take cases that were really needed, that we can go in and investigate what's going on and take care of business. Uh, uh, people asked me the other day, they said, what, how do you handle a case when you first start out? Well, the first thing I do, I, I do the initial uh, uh, interview over the phone to see what, what we're dealing with. And then I will personally go out, Shaman and I will go out and scout the neighborhood. We'll see what the house looks like. You know, if there's any water nearby, if there's any power lines nearby, what we're going to have to deal with, all that kind of stuff. And then I'll go back and I'll, and I'll get with my team. I said, look, uh, it's safe enough for me to bring my team in. I will not take my team into a situation that I think they're going to get hurt. If I think that uh, this person has maybe a mental problem and or we're dealing with a schizophrenic or somebody with a, you know, a, 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 you know, a drug addict or an alcoholic or something like that, and I go out and scout it, and I see this going on, then I'll go back and tell the team, you know what, we'll investigate this a little bit further before I take a full-blown uh, investigation into that house because I don't want to walk in there and people, you know, are fighting and there's weapons everywhere and drugs everywhere and stuff like that. Uh, if I think uh, a different kind of intervention is needed, like law enforcement, then I'll send law enforcement in. If we see any kind of abuse going on, anything like that, we'll send law enforcement in on that. Uh, but as far as my team goes, they're hand-picked. Uh, and, you know, I know when we go out and do a case that I know that uh, nobody's going to run. We'll stand our ground and we'll, we'll finish the case. Yeah. Um, one of my team members uh, one time said, um, when they said, oh, my God, you know, she's, she's not what we expected. You know, they expect what they see on TV, these very thin girls in their 20s and stuff. And uh, it, it, my team uh, member said, yeah, but you know what? If you were in hell, she would get you out. And, and that's what I look for in my team. Um, like you said, I want them to stand. And if I go down, then they have to stand. They can't stand because I stand. They have to stand with me. We all have to be able to stand. And that's what I call it, standing. You know, you've got to stand up against it. And, and sometimes uh, we, I've had guns pointed at me. Um, we've walked into homes with rifles all over the place and guns. And, and uh, you know, people's motives can get real scary, especially right now with people looking for their homes to be haunted so they get more money for them if they sell them or uh, we get dragged out a couple of hundred miles and then you find out oh well I wrote a book and and I get really upset and I tell them I told you I, I don't get into that you know um, what do you do how do you deal with people that um, and they all want it they think that Investigation is almost entertainment now. Do, what do you? What are your thoughts on that? You ask me first. Um, I guess so. Yeah. Uh, I, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, I worked a case. We worked a case about four months ago, where the lady says there's a demon in my house. Uh, so I took the, my soul warriors in there. We did our walkthrough. Um, I did my initial investigation and uh and i told the lady I said you do not have a demon here you have an attachment that came into the house i we went on ahead and did a clearing and a blessing i said well, you're good you know um there was uh something going on down in the basement where this thing had, had uh, built up its energy uh its energy but I, I i took care of that i i took uh, i bounded it out and everything was cool so about a month later, I get a call back. Hey, you know, this thing is playing, you know, I'm in bed and this thing is touching me and I, it's a demon. I said, it's not a demon. So I go back again and I go through the house. The house is clear. Um, she has got this in her mind that she's being touched and that uh, we didn't do our job. I said, yes, we did do our job. The house is clear. 
uh, he might be feeling a little bit of residual energy, but the house is clear. In her mind, we did not do a good job. We did not do our job. Uh, they almost want it case, to be there. Uh, in that case, you know, I told my soul warriors, and they said, well, what do we do, Willie? I said, and we're, I'm closing the case out. The case is, you know, uh, it, the file is going to say what we did and when we did it, what time we did it, both times we, I was there. And this is what had happened. And uh, the the person that really got mad um, took my, you know, uh, took me off of, off their Facebook. Everything else, like we never did exist. So, no matter what you do, if a person's got it in their head that they have a demon, even though they don't have one, and they really want it, there's nothing right. you can do. The, and that's my soul words. I said just that we need to back off. It's gone from. Uh, spiritual now to mental, and then we, you know, yeah. I said it. Uh, I told the lady, I said you need to get some counseling now, and that's what you need. Now, all you people don't know what you're doing. There's a demon here. I know it. I've been touched sexually, and no, you're not. You, you, you know, no. uh, there's nothing here. And uh, no matter what you do, and even after you after you solve a case, and they say no, 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 there's something still here. Uh, I, I have to stand my ground and say, look. Uh, this whole warrior is, is done, and uh, we're clearing the case. And you know, we, I wish you well. And that sometimes you have to do that. Mm -hmm. What about you, Carla? Yeah, I'm along the same lines with Willie. Um, you know, there, it, I had a case that I went in, and you know, it kind of just you know, I done my thing, cleared the house, everything was great. They didn't listen to my follow up instructions. And so, according to them, everything was back to way, the way it was. But they wanted to know if there was any way that it could get on the Internet or on TV. Yeah. No, it can't, sorry. <laughs> and mm -hmm. um, I was really, you know, put, put off by that. And when the lady actually called me again and said that she had lights in the trees responding to her flashlight as she would flash it, I closed that out and wrote it off. That's it. Mm -hmm. Done. Mental. And, you know, you have to walk away. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of people, that is one of the first things they'll say. And, and you know, it's just going to be out there. Is this going to be on the Internet? Is this going to be, you know, do you put pictures up and all this? And I said, no, I don't. You mm -hmm. know, and, and then they don't want you a lot of times. Yeah. Yeah, they actually, they actually look at it as entertainment or, oh, we're going to be famous. We're going to get, and when I try to explain things like the haunting in Connecticut, I talked to that woman, and she said it wasn't what it appeared, but she's under a gag order. If she actually tells people what went down, she's going to get sued by the people well. who made the movie and wrote the books and everything else. So that's, when they're watching this stuff on TV, they think, oh, my God, we're going to be famous, and, and we're going to be on TV, and we're going to have movies, you know, and... And they're just going to ruin their lives, their families' lives. Everybody's going to think they're a nut, you know. Um, mm -hmm. and, but they all think it's entertainment. It's it's really a sin. I, I really, at first people said, oh, all this crap on TV was really going to help the field. But it hasn't. It, it's, it really hasn't. It's made it a lot worse. Willie, where is your, uh, convent, uh, your Paracon? You're going to do it next October, right? I'm going to do it next October. I'm in negotiations now for a site. I'm actually going to go and talk to the people Monday and get to get it down uh, legally and on contract. And when it when I do that, I'll come back and I'll tell you where the site is and what dates and things. Mm -hmm. uh, you've done this before, so you know it should be good. You know it should be a, a good time. Uh, what What are you thinking in the way of uh, you know? Guest speakers? Are you going to have vendor tables? Are you thinking a lot? I'm going point? to have vendor. I'm going to have vendors, but this is going to be a totally different thing, other than just the things that you see at every convention. Uh, it's going to be a very, very supernatural and, and spiritual thing. I'm going to have Bishop Long. Uh, he's going to do a lecture on demonology. I might have a very good lecture on UFOs. Um, like I said, I'm going to have. Uh, 
different readers, different vendors. Um, I'm going to have a lot of Native American flavor to it. Um, a lot of culture, uh, more culture than anything. Um, and it's, a, it's going to be a learning um, a type of uh, uh, event. So people are going to walk in and say, wow, I've never been anything like this before. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm out for. Mm-hmm. And uh, are you planning on attending it there, Carla? Oh, yes, I will be there, absolutely. <laughs> cool. I want to thank you both for coming on. Um, I, I hope that this was a nice, easy evening for you both. A uh, lot of information. I think we had a really interesting discussion about everything. Uh, and I hope you both come back when you've got more uh, going on. How was it for you guys? Great. It was a great show. Yeah, it was great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and again, uh, Carla, give them your Facebook so they can find you. It's Carly Day on Facebook, or they can reach me at my email. It's tyffin7 at yahoo.com. Okay. Uh, this show is going to be on my Podomatic, and um, I'll put it up on uh, tomorrow at some time. It'll be uh, on YouTube, but it won't have the music because I'm not paying them to put the music on there uh but it will be around and um i hope uh everybody enjoyed the show and all you guys have to do is hang up and uh thank you god bless you uh god keep you safe uh as you do the work that you do and thank you so much for being on thank you for having having us thank you uh, all you got to do is hang up on the phone and you'll be clear. Next week, um, hopefully, because today I was supposed to interview Ronnie Bryant. She is a uh, Texas girl who is a singer-songwriter. Uh, she was supposed to be on for the first hour today, but um, I couldn't get the, uh, the board working for the uh, show. So um, I'm going to interview her tomorrow around noon time and uh, play that next week and then we're going to um, kick off and start with some um, uh, Halloween stuff you know we're going to uh, start getting into some Halloween stories and stuff like that Nancy Kersey is going to be on too she's written a book Jonathan and me uh, about Jonathan Fridge so she's going to be on and uh, Ronnie uh, Bryant. And then on the 29th is going to be a totally Halloween show. So uh, I, I hope everybody enjoys it. Uh, don't forget Rose Hill. They're, they're going to be uh, having the tours for uh, to raise money for the uh, Historical Society. The uh, Burroughs Mansion was uh, a big house during the Revolutionary War in Matawan. There was a battle in the front lawn. Uh, John Burroughs was uh, a lieutenant under Washington, D uh, Washington, George Washington. So it's important that we um, preserve our history in this country. We're a young country. We're not like England and other countries that are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old with castles. Our, our history is very fragile, and, and if we don't preserve it, nobody else will. And everybody, I hope, uh, does well. God bless you all. I hope everybody does well during uh, this next week. Uh, and I hope maybe uh, the, um, what do you call it, the uh, Congress and uh, the President and the Senate, I hope they all grow up enough to uh, actually get something done and get, uh, get us to a point where we can pay our bills but uh, and stay solvent, and uh, that means everybody's got to tighten their belts. Again, thank you for listening. God bless you all. I love you all. visiting me at my lair. You can always contact me at www.asylumsgate.com. Again, thank you for visiting. 
and God bless you and yours.